Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this uh, economic impact of uh, March 30th, 2023. As usual, I have my uh, distinguished guest, uh, Stéphane Marion, with us this, uh, this morning, in fact, today, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the, uh, what happened in the last uh, few weeks, in fact, the last two weeks, about uh, the bank sector uh, across the planet. Stéphane. Yeah, not very pleasant, the no. new when you think about it. Uh, reminds us of 2008, and uh, what you see on the first slide is first slide is quite telling. Uh, $320 billion of assets that have been uh, pummeled uh, in the sector with only one or two banks. Uh, something, it's, it's actually, you know, it was actually even worse than what we saw in 2008, 2009. But I think the source of the problem was somewhat different, right, Denis? Yeah, you know, it's totally different. You know, in 2008, 2009, it was more about credit than anything else. And it was widespread. This time around, it's more about the rate hikes that we saw uh, in the summertime that now affect some of the business, which are some banks that are very, very narrow businesses and type of businesses that it's not widespread across the whole banking sector uh, in the planet. Totally different. We can compare this situation as what happened in, 2000, in the eight, late 90s about the saving and loans, which was at the same time, you know, uh, some uh, saving and loans uh, went bankrupt because of rate hikes at that time. And for the same reason, they have some un unbalanced money, you know, and uh, uh, unbalanced uh, way to hedge their their own uh, treasury uh, portfolio. Then uh, same thing that happened, uh, you know, two weeks ago with the SVB banks and the signature banks. Yeah. So asset liability management becomes an issue yes. when you have an erosion of your deposit base. And mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, uh, for the first time since 1975, the new uh, deposits in the U.S. Uh, at U.S. commercial banks declining on a year-over-year -year basis uh, at, at at the pace that is never been observed in the past. This is unprecedented. Part of that, Denis, however, people have to be careful in the interpretation. Never forget that despite this drop in the deposit base, the deposits are still 11% above the pre-COVID trend. Why? Because don't forget that during COVID, there was a significant increase in excess savings at the consumer level, and also corporations that had a significant amount of profits, particularly in the IT sector, mm -hmm. uh, that led to a big increase in the deposit base. So I think when you start interpreting what's happening at the deposit base, you have to think that something is coming back to normal. But you're absolutely right, Denis, when you say that rapid rate hikes uh, makes it more difficult for institutions that don't have proper risk management in order to manage their asset liability. Yeah. Uh, that becomes an issue, right? Yeah, this, this is why we need to be very careful about how we look at the data right now, because I think it's just kind of a normal that we see those deposits coming back to where they were pre-pandemic. It's going to take some time, but it's going to take time. But also at the same time, because of the rate hikes, you're going to see people moving from cash account to GICs. And then you're going to see a kind of erosion in the uh, bank account deposit. Then let's be careful here, okay? Because I think people are watching it very, very carefully right now. But we need to see, you know, a bit of a story of uh, where we're coming from versus where we can go. Then uh, let's be careful here. And for the moment, Denis, uh, what's important is the Federal Reserve did not sit idle. They addressed the liquidity issues yeah. uh, by providing new facilities uh, for commercial banks to tap into if needed uh, in order to do a better matching of their uh, asset liabilities. Asset um, and what you can see that um, since the deployment of these facilities, you can see that the S&P 500 is actually uh, up since March 8, since we had the problem uh, mm -hmm. of SVB. Um, what is quite evident, however, on this slide, Denise, is the banking sector in the U.S. remains stressed. And part of that reflects the fact that people are awaiting probably more stringent regulations in the U.S. Yeah. in the aftermath of the SVB fiasco, uh, which uh, will uh, have an impact on the profitability of the banking sector, particularly in the U.S., right? Yeah, but once again, you know, uh, more uh, stringent uh, rules, it's really for the uh, you know, regional bank, not for the, the DCIB or the GCIB. Those banks are really, really well regulated right now. And uh, I can tell you, OSFI, the Feds, and all those regulators are really watching what's going on uh, in all those banks uh, day after day. Then no big concern on that front. But, you know, uh, Trump decided to relax a little bit the rules for those uh, regional banks uh, when he was in power. 
Now I think uh, obviously we will have to come back to where we were uh, back then. Then no surprise there. But also at the same time, we had what happened with uh, Credit Suisse, you know, which is yeah. totally another uh, subject, totally another situation. This is not linked at all with regional bank, but it did affect uh, the uh, equity market at the same time. And, and that's why we have some discrepancy between, uh, you know, uh, rate of return of uh, those uh, those market. Uh, you want to talk a bit more about that? Well, yeah, and, and what's important is there's been, when people fear contagion to the banking sector, the global banking sector is impacted. Now, if you see on the next slide, U.S. banks are still down more than 14% since uh, March 8th. What's important on this slide, Denis, is to note the resiliency of Canadian banks. So yeah. we've seen some contagion, some people are worried about uh, the overall banking sector, uh, but the drawdown to Canadian banks is much smaller than what mm -hmm. we saw elsewhere around the world, and it down only 6%. And I think part of that reflects uh, the fact that unlike the US, we have not seen an erosion, an erosion of the deposit base. It's actually is still trending up in Canada. And I think that's a significant divergence of what you see in the US and in Europe, right, Denis? Yeah, um, yeah, totally. And, and in Canada, uh, we haven't seen anything. In fact, if there's anything in that, the chart showed, showed it that we are seeing more and more deposit getting in the uh, Canadian banks, then, which is totally the opposite of what we're seeing uh, somewhere else. Then uh, I don't think we can expect any big movement in that front. Maybe cash account to GIC, as I said earlier, yes, for sure. But uh, money is pouring in and there's a good reason for that. True, uh, but before we drop to the really good reasons, we, you do agree also at the same time that unlike the U.S., the bank has a little bit more pragmatic. They stop yeah. with the rate hikes. They're pausing yeah. uh, at this point in time. Uh, and I think the reason they're able to pause is because inflation is also coming down faster on this side of the border. True. That's important to need, right? True, and, and, and there was a bit of a discussion around uh, you know, the uh, what the Bank of Canada decided. They, they were the first bank really to say, uh, that they're going to stop uh, hiking rates and they want to see uh, what's going on. And rightly so, you know, and when you see uh, what they did and the comment that they had in the market, I think it cooled down quite a lot what people can expect for Keynesian banks and the Keynesian economy and so on and so forth. Then, uh, you know, for this time, they, I think they, they hike fast and pretty hard, but they were the first really to say, oh, we're stopping, we're going to wait and see. And it was uh, timely, it was perfect, in fact. I, I think so. And, mm. and when you hike rates aggressively like that, you might risk breaking stuff. So it's important exactly. to take a pause at some point to assess yeah. the situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, Denise is absolutely right. One of the key factors that underpins the growth in deposits in this country are demographic forces, yeah. uh, which are actually unprecedented in terms of population growth in Canada. We're seeing one million people added to the, to the population last year. Uh, Denis, I mean, the last summits that we've seen in the past were about mm -hmm. 600,000 people. So 1 million people, to put things in perspective, in France, population is growing at 100,000 people a year. In the UK, 200,000 people a year. So Canada outperforms France and UK combined by a factor of three to one. Mm -hmm. That is really impressive. Plus the fact that population is skewed towards the uh, cohort age 25 to 54, which mm -hmm. is a natural clientele a client base for a Canadian financial institution. So under these circumstances, um, an erosion of the deposit base when you have the best demographics in the OECD uh, is uh, less likely, less likely uh, yeah. when you compare that to other countries. So under these circumstances, uh, we don't believe that we'll see the same erosion of the deposit base mm -hmm. uh, that's been observed elsewhere around the world. Yeah, and you've been talking about uh, demography for, for a while now, and I think now it's showing up again that it's very important to look at really my, micro uh, economics data that can help you to understand what's going on and uh, what can happen. And I think this one is, is very particular to the Canada and uh, it explained quite a lot why we had so much, you know, a good economic environment for years and years and years. And now with that crisis or seemingly crisis, I would say, uh, contained crisis in very specific area, uh, once again, the demography will help quite a lot the uh, banking center in Canada, but also the, the, uh, the overall economy. 
So what do we do with uh, all those events now? Well, Denis, How, where do we invest our money? Well, Denis, you mentioned regional banks, okay? And, and just to put things in perspective, again, there's 4,700 financial institutions in the U.S. Yeah. and you talked about the big ones. It might be maybe 12 of them. So 12 of them, that's if 4,000 yeah. banks are likely to face more stringent mm -hmm. uh, regulations, there's going to be less credit available in the U.S. economy in the coming months, yeah. which argues for maybe a less aggressive Federal Reserve. That's good news, but also means a slower economy. So for the time being, Denis, uh, let's see how the dust, dust settles on all this. Mm -hmm. Let's be a little bit more defensive, have some cash, a little bit over uh, benchmarks, but also fixed income. We've added fixed income. We're actually overweight fixed income for, very, for the first time in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the prudent way to assess the situation. So again, I think we've avoided the worst so far with the liquidity issue from the Fed. That's good news, but the economy is about to slow down. So let's be a little bit more defensive. Uh, you're still expecting rates going down at the end of the year with the Bank of Canada? Canada, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Modest. Rate cut, uh, yes. Uh, U.S. remains to be seen. Yeah. Uh, let's hope we get this inflation uh, that uh, decelerates a little bit faster in the coming weeks. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, hope you enjoy uh, that. Uh, you know, a little bit of a background of what's going on. You know, in the uh, in the overall uh, Canadian economy, but also you know the worldwide economy. Uh, very, very interesting comment, Stefan, and uh, hopefully it's going to be very useful for you. It was a pleasure for us to to give you a bit of uh, our insight. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening and we'll see you next time.